white text over video of past events. Logo, Cultural Access Collaborative. Professional Development Series presents Nothing About Us Without Us, Meaningful Collaboration with the Disability Community. At left, presentation slides. At top right, mini video of presenting speaker. Below, an ASL interpreter signs. Hello. Welcome to Nothing About Us Without Us. Meaningful collaboration with the disability community. This program is presented by Cultural Access Collaborative. My name is Susan Friel. I'm one of the steering committee members. I use she, her pronouns. I am dressed in blue with some blue and purple streaks in my hair. I have purple glasses. And behind me are three images by Carl Worsom, of which you can only see the feet. So three pairs of feet behind me. For those of you not familiar with the CLAB, our mission is to empower Illinois' cultural spaces to become more accessible to visitors with disabilities. There are four primary pillars central to our work, and those include free professional development workshops, an accessible equipment loan program, an accessible event calendar, as well as community building across the local region and beyond. I'm joined today by our featured guest, Jesse Swanson, as well as my fellow CoLab members, Andy Wilson and Bill Green. Accessibility is a priority for us, and our program today includes real-time captioning provided by efficiency reporting, as well as ASL interpretation provided by Faith Interpreting Services. If you'd like to view captions in a separate browser, you can do so using the stream text link included in the chat now. We also have a Q&A feature enabled, and we encourage you to utilize that feature to submit questions throughout the event. If you have any issues with accessibility, please don't hesitate to reach out to our support team using the chat function, and Matt will run to your aid. And speaking of the chat, I'd like to uh, repeat to take a moment to learn about who's in the room. If you could please drop into the chat what institution or organization you hail from and what role you play there. I see we have someone from Full Radius Dance joining us. That's great. And PA Museums, that's pretty wonderful. And friends here at Steppenwolf Theater Company, folks from all over the place. We have Garfield Park Conservatory joining us today. And the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. More folks from Chicago National Public Housing Museum. Looks like we're expecting a full house here. We've got Shed Aquarium on board, Lifeline Theater, Botanic Garden, tons of great folks. We're so delighted to have you all here with us today. And now we'd like to welcome our first guest, um, my colleague from the steering committee, Andy Wilson, who will set some context for today and to get us started. Take it away, Andy. Hi there, uh, I'm Andy Wilson. I use he, him pronouns. I work at the Goodman Theater as one of their house managers, as well as their accessibility coordinator. Um, I'm a white man in my mid thirties. I have uh, blonde shaggy hair and a red beard and glasses. Um, I'm sitting in front of a colorful beaded tapestry behind me. Um, if we wanted to advance the next slide, we can talk about uh, the first part of this program, uh, which is informal ev evaluations. Um, this one may seem like the most obvious because uh, it's the most sort of on the ground job. Um, there are a couple of photos on this slide. Um, at the top, there is a photo of the Goodman stage with uh, a part of a Christmas Carol set on it. It is Scrooge's house. Um, and we have uh, folks who are experiencing the touch tour on stage with some of our staff members. So about a dozen folks are walking across the stage, feeling different parts of the set um, as we're describing it. Uh, there's another photo to the right. Um, it's a social media post from Comer Children's Hospital about a Christmas Carol. Um, it's at about uh, us sharing a video of the Christmas Carol with Comer Children's Hospital. And then the third photo has, um, it's a, headline for a blog post uh, it's called accessibility in chicago a local shares favorite spots for blind and visually impaired visitors uh, so essentially what i'm talking about is 
being with people um, and the informal evaluation that comes with just general feedback from being with folks. Um, I can't express the importance of having a point person, someone that people can go to in your organization. Um, I know that many organizations do not have someone who's uh, specified as like the access coordinator or manager. Um, that's the ideal world. And I know that we're just not always in the place for that, but it's always so much easier if there's someone in the organization whose job that sort of falls under. Um, at Goodman, there's a lot of people who work on access. There's the production department, there's marketing, there's uh, front of house. Um, and so we work in a lot of different departments, but that there's still one point person that people can reach out to and speak to is really helpful. Um, we even have a specific access email. Um, so if someone doesn't have my email or someone doesn't know me, our website does still have an accessibility email that you can reach out if you have specific questions. And like our box office also has access to that email um, and different departments do, but primarily it's my job to answer those things. Um, so that when people have questions, they know that it's me that they're coming to. Um, they know, they get to know me. Uh, I also really want to emphasize the importance of being on site during your accessible events. Um, it's important to see what's working in the moment. Uh, it's important to see your staff, how they're reacting, what training they might need, what resources you might need to give them, what you're lacking. Um, it's important to see how people are engaging with your program. Uh, it can be really difficult to find time to be at every access event that you have. Um, but if you're that point, point person, I really encourage you to spend the time to be at these events uh, and learn how to be agile in the moment to make changes. Um, it can be as simple as making a seating change to as complicated as uh, finding an ASL interpreter on the fly. Um, but being at the event allows you to be more flexible. Um, there's also tremendous value in finding community events to attend. Uh, many universities in our area have events that you can attend. Columbia has an incredible ASL program and they have panels and student student led things that you can attend. Um, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about may be Chicago specific or regional specific, but it's almost always stuff that you can look up and find what's happening in your community. Uh, you can join email lists, mailing lists for organizations, uh, for instance, our own mailing list. Um, and you can look at uh, our calendar for what's going on in the area. Uh, I encourage you to go to other access programs that other cultural institutions are running, whether you're at a museum or a theater, um, just to see how everyone else is doing their work, volunteer with them. Um, you're going to meet some of the same folks that are coming to your access programs. Uh, you're going to see how they react to uh, different accommodations that are made, um, and you'll be able to use what you learn in your own programs. Uh, again, it's hard to find the time to attend all the different access events in a, a large city, but uh, it really is worth it. Um, in Chicago, the Chicago Autism Network has an expo coming up in uh, next month, actually. Uh, that's something that can be tabled at. Um, I encourage you to be involved in the VCA International Network, uh, which is an incredible sort of email list and uh, group of webinars and training sessions. Um, and you're going to get questions and answers from people who are, again, the point person for their organizations accommodations and accessibility work. Um, work with local organizations, go to them, tour them, meet with them. Um, here, there's the Hadley Institute for the Blind, the Chicago Lighthouse, there's assisted living facilities, there's hospitals. Um, this is where you really wanna work with your marketing team to get on email lists and reach out to folks. Um, but there's tremendous value in being that point person who goes physically to these spaces and meets with people. Um, Word of mouth is a huge thing uh, in our community. Uh, our calendars are incredible. Our marketing teams are incredible, but it's still a lot of word of mouth driven work. Um, so the more that you are trusted in your community, uh, the more that people are going to invest in your programs. Uh, and if you cultivate those relationships, you ask for specific feedback, you ask for okay, we had this provider, how did you feel about their performance? What notes did you have? 
Um, okay, we're going to make that adjustment for you. Um, you're going to get some really good feedback. You're going to get um, people's trust, and that's the most important thing. Um, find ways to be with people. Have conversations with people. Watch what they're experiencing with their with these programs. Um, your access programs are for people, so keep them close. That's all I wanted to talk about with our informal evaluations. I think we can go to our next topic. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Green. I'm a white man with dark hair and beard wearing glasses and a plaid shirt. Um, and I'm sitting in my office at Lincoln Park Zoo where I work as the Accessibility and Inclusion Manager. And I'm also a steering committee member uh, of the of CAC. And I wanna talk a little bit about doing formal surveys or formal evaluation with people who have disabilities. And thinking about this when we're doing formal, uh, collecting formal feedback, whether it's after a program or event, or just some more general feedback about um, the experience at our institutions and so on, that a lot of times the formal email, formal surveys go out as emails, and that can be great, to, especially uh, in something like that, keeping it short, say the four to six questions, doing a mix of the multi-choice. It's always great to leave open a blank field to collect feedback from people, because you might be sending out a survey about a specific program that people attended and having a blank field just to collect that additional, any extra responses is a great place to collect information about an accessibility issue that maybe came come up uh, during the, the time at the institution, the program that you hadn't anticipated. So it can be a really great learning tool, but doing those formal surveys and allowing for um, alternative formats can be great. So on this slide, there's a picture of a staff member here at Lincoln Park Zoo in their uh, uniform talking to somebody doing those in-person interviews that can be a great tool to use um, talking to people doing it live like that but additional alternatives offering people alternatives of doing it say recording doing voice recordings of their responses to surveys offering to do it over the phone with somebody um, even just having available a pen and pencil if someone prefers that over using an example like this the staff member has, um, uh, it's either a clipboard or an iPad, but a lot of time we use iPads at the zoo. Um, and then I'm a, I'm a big proponent of not creating required fields. A lot of times when we're working with disability communities, there's a, already a lot of onus put on them and there can be a, a feel of a lot of burden putting on them. So one way of just relieving that is by creating, uh, excuse me, not creating required fields and allowing people to opt out of questions very easily. It's really about opting into that. So that's that voluntary responses. The inclusive language point is here is that I've seen in a lot of surveys that go out to people, language like, does anyone in your group identify as disabled? And it's that, it's that language that really I, is written in a way that assumes the person who is responding is not disabled, um, collecting that information. I see that a lot, uh, where it's it's thinking that the person who's taking the survey is taking it on behalf of someone who is disabled. I feel like that's a real common mistake. So when writing those surveys, writing those formal feedback questions, remember that the person who you're going to be sur uh, surveying uh, may or may not identify as disabled. Don't assume that they do not identify as disabled. And then ethical practices, we have seen um, so many unethical practices. We're talking about people with disabilities, a very marginalized population, and there's been a long history of that population being taken advantage of in formal evaluation, in research. So when we're talking about formal um, or ethical practices. One thing we do at Lincoln Park Zoo is we have an internal review board that make sure that we are um, following ethical practices. If you do not have an internal review board, I highly recommend it. One great advantage of it is it just trains people about the history of ethical violations. Um, it trains people about uh, all the risks that might be involved. I'll talk about that in a minute. But there is a group, uh, Commercial IRB or the Heartland Institutional Review Board, that can do this for organizations that don't have it. It's a great way to be certified and make sure the evaluation that you're doing follows some ethical practices. 
some things to highlight here about what that IRB does, what that does, is talking about how are you getting consent from people? When you're evaluating people, um, are you getting verbal consent? Are you getting written consent? If this is a long-term evaluation you're doing where there's multiple steps with people, are you getting um, consent at every step of that? And then also, are you getting assent in cases where someone is not able to give consent? Maybe you're working with children and you also need consent of an adult. Um, so talking about what assent is also. And then it also really highlights what the risks are to your population. When we're talking about people with disabilities. We could definitely be asking questions and there could be emotional risk to someone. You could be asking a question that somebody feels uh, there is informational risk to them, that they are giving information that they are uncomfortable about. Um, so thinking about how do we create questions and how do we put people in situations where we are not putting them at risk? Uh, there's been so many violations for that. So I'm definitely a fan of using the IRB and thinking about all those ethical practices we do. So talk a little more about some other things, but I'm really excited because I get to introduce our next speaker. Um, Jesse Swan is an executive producer at IO Theater and a tremendous accessibility advocate. And I'm very excited to have him here. Welcome, Jesse. Next slide, boards and buy-in. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, as Bill mentioned, my name is Jesse Swanson. Um, I'm the executive producer at IO Theater. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Um, much like many of my other panelists today, I am a white man in my mid-30s um, wearing glasses, and I've intentionally blurred the background behind me so that you don't have to see my messy apartment. Um, and uh, I'm, wearing a, I'm wearing the one button-down shirt uh, I have. Um, with a sweater over it. Um, I'm so pleased to be a part of this program today um, to talk a little bit about um, advisory boards and institutional buy-in. And um, the reason that both of these things are important in the context of this larger conversation is truly um, how do we get the individuals that you are looking to build programs for actively involved in the conversation and actively involved in the organization? And so um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on me and my access journey before we dive into sort of best practice and advisory board, et cetera. Um, I started in access at uh, the Second City, where um, truly I was the only individual um, with an identifiable disability on the full-time staff. And so what ended up happening um, was more often than not, I would, uh, I would be asked, oh, hey, how are we doing um, with individuals with disabilities? Uh, hey, can you take a look at this legal language? Um, and, and more often than not, uh, it ended up being a situation where uh, I was unfortunately giving some pretty difficult feedback to the company um, that I was working for. And, uh, and so rather than, rather than take that on as a burden, I sort of took the opportunity to pivot that and say, okay, um, if we're interested in in avoiding lawsuits or reaching the um, reaching the bare minimum of required standard at Second City, what opportunities actually present themselves? So what I realized um, in doing that work for Second City was was more that there was uh, not not just to get us up to sort of baseline compliance, but there was actually a ton of need um, for access in our art form. In, in, our, in my experience, a lot of what had been offered with accessible services were um, programming for children, um, dramatic programming, things at, at Steppenwolf with the Goodman, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, there wasn't comedy in the space, right? And, um, and if I've learned anything as a disabled comedian, um, humor and disability have to go together. They just absolutely have to. Um, and so, you know, it, it became this huge opportunity for me um, to, to introduce our art form to a group of people that just hadn't had the chance to see it before. Um, and so I formed the Accessibility Committee over at um, Second City probably in 2015 um, and learned a lot along the way. Um, one of the things that I think is really, really important and was a little frustrating in my experience at the Second City and that I got to sort of remake and redesign um, with IO Theater was um, that they had separated out accessibility from their other um, DEIA initiatives. That A was missing um, in, in that acronym. And so, you know, one of the frustrations was that I essentially had to build my own initiative in my own department um, sep separately um, from, the, uh, from the diversity 
um, initiative that had already started over there. And so if you, even when you have the opportunity, both um, just culturally and budgetarily, marrying um, accessibility into your um, diversity initiatives that are already in place uh, in your institution is hugely important. Um, but one of the things that I was able to do at Second City that was very exciting to me was build an advisory board. And again, this is about getting individuals who you are programming for actively involved in the conversation and what it takes to make um, those programs. So why? Again, we want to make sure that we're getting the people uh, that our decisions are affecting to be engaged in the room where the decisions are happening. Um, and secondly, there, it's about building a community, right? The, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the members of your advisory board should be fans of your work and should be passionate about what it is that you're making and want to be involved in it um, and vice versa and the vice versa is true as well right so we want to we want to um, not only build a, a actionable board but also one that is um, creatively artistically culturally engaged in what you're doing and you have and that's another chance to build community um, you're establishing long-term relationships in, 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 uh, with folks on your advisory board. They are, um, they will be your best advocates. As we've already established here, right, word of mouth um, and trust uh, is a huge part of the accessibility community um, and actively engaging those uh, members of your advisory board in conversation um, and establishing trust and a candid feedback loop is absolutely essential to doing this work well. Um, how do we do it? How do we put together an advisory board? Well, there are a ton of ways to do it. Uh, I did it independently of the DEIA initiatives at Second City, um, and I have now um, participated in, in building our DEIA board um, at the IO Theater. Um, and at the end of the day, what it comes down to is um, that you are interviewing individuals for a job. I think it's really important for us to shift the conversation away from volunteer uh, volunteerism and advocacy and free advocacy um, to uh, compensating them in any way that you can to be a part of your organization. Um, and similar as you would with any other role, you want to define that role and the relationship that this advisory board has to your organization. Um, practically, functionally, um, this is something that I'm working on with the advisory board, um, with the, um, the advisory board at IO right now is to say, okay, how are we practically engaged with one another? Are you, are you completing work on the company's behalf? Are you advising on the company's behalf? Um, and again, defining those goals and how you're going to utilize those individuals' time um, is a really, really important part of this process. And it's something that we're actively engaged in um, at IO is figuring out where those lanes exist and how we can support each other. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is allowing some degree of independence or autonomy uh, by establishing a charter or bylaws for an advisory board uh, is to say how um, allow them to self govern and make some decisions and put on paper how their decisions will impact um, the organization as a whole, um, and what what ability do they have to enter into the larger business discussion? Um, and certain, you know, leadership teams are going to find different degrees of appropriateness as far as inviting, um, you know, outside opinion. Uh, but obviously, I I fight am fighting for as much of an integration between our advisory board and our leadership team um, as possible. And last but not least, um, I would invite and involve your company leadership team. Um, into the access and DEIA advisory board meetings as often as possible. Creating visibility around the work that's being done is so, so, so important. Um, if, your, if your leadership team um, can see the tangible benefit um, of the work that's being done for access, uh, they will see uh, that 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 expenditure will be justified, essentially, right? Um, and so uh, one of the things that I want to shift now to is the institutional buy-in, right? And this is all a part of essentially saying, hey, how do I get my enormous organization to get on board with these ideas? Um, because, you know, again, oftentimes the conversation begins with compliance is, hey, we're not compliant. How do we get to ADA compliance? But we, we know or should know 
that compliance is the bare minimum, right? So we want to we want to pivot the conversation from avoiding potential lawsuits to um, identifying opportunity, future opportunity, right? Um, and part of that is being able to be vocal in articulating the value of access work. And if you want to throw statistics, if statistics are your your friend here, you can say, hey, twenty percent of the population uh, identifies as having a disability, and that's twenty percent uh, of an audience that we don't have yet. So let's start to build things for that community. Um, the other thing that I would uh, outline is to say, who are the influencers and decision makers inside your community? So for me at Second City, um, the, that building is uh, not actually run, but sort of socially run um, by the cast on stage. And as soon as we were able to put some open caption programming together and to outline for the cast, um, the value of these programs, uh, you saw their eyes light up and go, wait a second, we never even considered this. Um, and once they had that first experience with an individual who came to see um, an open caption performance or an ASL performance and understood the value of what, of what we were doing, they were immediately on board. And understanding that they have a ton of social cachet or social power um, in the organization to shift ideology is huge. Um, the other thing that's really important is just um, is just expectation setting, right? When you're dealing with your leadership team, make sure that they know, hey, access is not a moneymaker. Um, it's an audience builder. It's an opportunity. Um, and last but not least, um, I just wanted to make sure that as we're doing this work, as you're putting together access programming, that you're regularly celebrating your success, both internally and externally, right? It's really important for your institutions to say, hey, uh, we're doing this great work and create some narrative around um, the impact that your programs have had. Uh, if you have the opportunity to capture feedback through uh, surveys or informal surveys, um, please do that and share that often with your leadership team. Okay, I think I hit all my points. Um, happy to take questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. This is Bill again. So I'll take over this next slide about working with consultants. Um, as the point of view of having been someone who's a consultant, uh, I wanna say that when you're working with a consultant related to accessibility and programs, infrastructure, it's always better to have that consultant come in early on a project. It's always easier to co-create and build together rather than to have somebody come in after retrofit things. Um, pay your consultants, compensate them. Uh, it's it's uh, not necessarily the um the 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 burden of of uh the consultant to, to right to to tell you about accessibility for free to tell you about their lived experience for free so please compensate your consultants and then on the hand the void tokenism sometimes what happens when you're consulting with an organization and you're the person who's identified as disabled um organizations then look at you to be the spokesperson for all people with disabilities uh value the lived experience of your consultant and don't tokenize them as the spokesperson for all disabilities. And you'll have a much better um, and much more uh, like that, that respectful relationship with a consultant. Now I'll hand it off to Andy. Hey, it's Andy again. Um, so I wanted to talk about working with a consultant from the organization's point of view. Um, I've added a, a photo to this slide. It's of Chuck Grumman, our accessibility consultant for our sensory friendly shows um, at Goodman Theater. Um, she's worked with us for several years now. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about. There's uh, great value in building a relationship with a consultant over a program. Uh, the more they know your organization, the more familiar they are with your specific program, the better the work that they're going to be able to do for you. Um, I also second Bill's uh, affirmation that the earlier that you get them involved in the process, the better. Um, think how you can use your consultant. Uh, how early can you get them in? Can you get them in during the artistic planning process of something? Can you get them in during... Uh, rehearsals or texts for things? Uh, can they do training with your staff, with your crew? Uh, 
anything other than them arriving just the day of, although that is really important too, um, the more that you can make use of their expertise, the better it will be. Um, also advocate for their pay. Uh, always be paying them and advocate for their pay. Uh, a lot of consultants have uh, a feeling that they're, they're doing this to create access for others and maybe um, putting themselves second. Um, and that's not something you wanna take advantage of as an organization. Uh, encourage your organization to give raises as the years goes on with these programs. Um, and as far as finding the consultants themselves, ask for other organizations, get, get recommendations from other places that you trust, other places that have used a consultant. Um, and I really do encourage you to look for someone within the community. Uh, there will be situations where maybe um, parents of community members want to help out or uh, folks that... Uh, it should be really nothing without us, nothing about us without us. Someone from your community should be your consultant. Um, and I believe that we are ready for our next slide. Hi, and it's Bill again. We're gonna talk about some creating ongoing relationships with your institution and uh, people with disabilities or groups of people with disabilities. So, one great thing about having long-term partnerships with organizations is getting to make this into a learning opportunity where you begin to start building programs for groups versus them just being participants in it, right? You're beginning to know individuals um, and build personal relationships with them and best know how to create programs that support and benefit them, or I should say, best how to, how to create accessibility that, that supports and benefits them, um, whether that's in programs or again, infrastructure performances, events. Um, and so what uh, two of the pictures, the two top pictures on this slide are a group that Lincoln Park Zoo's had a long-term relationship with. Uh, it's young adults who have cognitive disabilities who have come uh, come several times a year, and we're always getting to do different and new things. Something that's been the great learning opportunity with this group is by providing programs for them, it's also helped us learn and sort of expand what we can provide for people with cognitive disabilities that are not part of this group. Um, and this is some of the most fun things that we do, having these personal relationships, getting to know the individuals in these pictures, uh, and having this long-term relationship over the years, it's really one of the most fun and rewarding parts of doing accessibility with partners over and over and having them come to things over and over again. So I'll hand it off to Susan. Well, hi there. Um, Susan back on screen, and I just wanted to share that a bit of a case study, if you will. So we've been talking a lot about how collaboration is important, making connections is important, and I want to kind of share with you one of the paths we went through here at the Cultural Center. So I work at a large institution that has many, many beautiful spaces, and way back in 2016, um, an organization that Bill was working for, the Blind Service Association, had for many years prior to his arrival, actually, use the space at the cultural center. So they basically signed up, they used the space for this Pathways it was Performing Arts program in the summer. And um, when Bill came on board and sort of surreptitiously, I was also on board and through some other connections, we sort of found each other and decided that maybe it's not just using the space. It's like, what are you doing here? What can we do together? And so just that kind of connecting the dots, I think being aware of who's in your orbit and what else is going on around the space can really be super helpful. And so we began where we are actually is, pardon me, that we have um, an existing tour program. So people would tour the building. And with after going through a walkthrough with Bill and kind of looking at the space, imagining how a group of people who are blind or have low vision, how they would interpret the space or how they would feel comfortable in the space. We came up with this um, tour that had many aspects of it. One being that our docents were companions. So we did more or less, we aimed for a one-on-one -on -one kind of situation, 
but that also gave our docents an opportunity to um, have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody as they walk through the building and to also be sensitive to what it was that folks needed. So we broke up the building into kind of bite-sized pieces. And that's kind of the other one is like, you know, our tour, we kind of in 45 minutes, make it through the building, many floors, it can be very confusing. It's like, what can we manage in, you know, an hour's worth of time plus? So we broke it up into some pieces um, and then this became kind of a quarterly situation for us. But in the, in the tour that we were giving, it was also more, we kind of shifted our thinking about it as an experience. So going through the building, you can hear it's kind of cavernous in here. There's a lot of echo. So we would go into spaces and talk about, can you imagine the size of this room? How you can hear your voice and clapping and such. And so people were able to experience the building and very importantly through touch. So we have many wonderful aspects of the building. And this is definitely, there's aspects of the building you can touch where you can feel marble and the mosaics. And we have a seal that people are allowed to touch, the city seal. And then also we were able to bring out little bits and pieces. We have like a really cool chunk of nails that were fused together during the Chicago fire. So it kind of helped us to think, use our imagination to see our building, experience our building through multiple senses. And um, having Bill and uh, the, his um, folks from the BSA, the Blind Service Association, always advising us, oh, can we try something else? Can we go somewhere different? Can we see this? There was like these um, spirals that are part of our elevator that are kind of like a little swirly um, um, wrought iron. And one of the um, visitors kind of felt that and he said, you got to feel this. And actually it feels like movement. So that's become kind of part of my standard uh, when I take people around, it's like close your eyes and feel this. And so we're learning new ways to experience the building as well. Um, one of the pieces, if you see this photo here, is, is kind of an orangish silicone mold, actually, which is a piece of the building. It has uh, plaster ceilings, right? So one of the medallions had fallen from the ceiling and it had to be recast. So this is an opportunity for people to see something, feel something, experience something that is 40 feet up in the air that you'd never be able to experience otherwise. And so we learned from that experience that a lot of other people want to feel this too. So it's become kind of part of our, of our way of doing things. And um, we actually uh, do quarterly tours. I mentioned before, we realized it wasn't good enough to have a one-off experience. And so we also were, um, they joined some artists who were in the Goat Island performance and they became performers. So they um, used their bodies to make sound. They got to try on the costumes. They got to do lots of really fun things. And then this tour, this, I'm sorry, this camp that we started off with really blossomed from being a performing arts camp to being a full on all arts camp. And so they had um, visual artists. They really, really dug this art cart that we had. And that also kind of um, tipped us in the direction of having a second art cart. So people now can experience the second dome that we have, the Grand Army of the Public Dome. So, you know, just do what you're doing, come back multiple times, um, not to sort of think we did it once, check that box, you know, if you're so lucky to have a great relationship with something like Bill, fantastic, but there's other people out there too. So you don't have to just have Bill, but I'm gonna send you back to Bill. I'm gonna go off screen here and he's gonna talk about co-creation. All right, and we can go to the next slide. All right, this is Bill again. I was gonna talk about co-creation, so really working hand in hand with people who have disabilities to create things at your institution. Um, one thing is a, a lot of people have had interest in input sessions or focus groups. And at Lincoln Park Zoo, we did uh, about a year ago, we were still in the middle of doing lots of input sessions, focus groups, brainstorming sessions. And there's a photo on this slide of one of those that happened over Zoom. It's probably a pretty typical size of what we had. Um, these input focus groups were um, anywhere from three or four people to maybe seven people. I thought that was a really good size. It let people have lots of time to participate and, and give lots of feedback. These input sessions or focus groups are a great place for your institution to model your accessibility. Just like today on the webinar, we're using ASL, captioning, et cetera, putting your accessibility resources um, at work for you during the sessions 
uh, it's a great way to show, first of all, where your strengths are, um, and so maybe some of where the areas you need improvement. And because you're working with a population that can also give you feedback, you can learn a lot from putting your, uh, from modeling your accessibility. And I think doing those small sizes actually is a great way of modeling accessibility too. Have questions prepared. Being on the other end of this, not giving the focus groups, but being in focus groups in the past and showing up and having it be um, so you, just this open ended, like, so what do you think about accessibility? Uh, they're not productive. Having questions prepared, and it can be even a great thing to share those with participants ahead of time to let them think about responses and so on. Uh, it'll be a much more productive session that way. Encourage tangents. Knowing that in our focus groups, we were really looking at interpretation. And the way I'm using interpretation is at the zoo, when we talk about interpretation, it's how we tell the stories at the zoo. It appears in our signage and, and so on. Um, but we had so much feedback um, and, and learned so many things about ticketing, bathrooms, lighting, et cetera. Uh, we got so much information from the tangents that people went on. We were able to create an entire second report from that. That information was able to influence strategic planning, campus planning. Uh, so that was extremely valuable to go on those tangents. So I think encourage that. Voluntary participation. Someone may show up to the uh, focus group and make the decision not to give feedback or or not be an active participant in in adding something to it. That's fine. I, I expect that that will happen and uh, and be prepared for that. And so allow follow up, leave a contact person, have somebody that can be called, that can be emailed, um, especially I feel like I'm someone too, where after the meeting ends, I'll then come up with that's when I come up with my ideas. Um, and so it's great to have that person that you can follow up with and do your own focus groups. This is, I, I would say, in um, uh, like maybe all capitals do your own do your own focus groups attending another institution's focus group is not doing your work uh and people in the disability community recognize when you're not doing your work uh, and they recognize those people who are doing it uh and so you should have specific sessions for your institution uh and not consider that you've you checked that box by attending another institution's um uh focus group so one thing that we're doing right now well let me talk about uh before i get to a, a, an absolute project so doing long-term partnerships with people and co-creation uh going beyond that focus group and this is what happened again at lincoln park zoo is uh, from focus groups we selected long-term partners i would say our partners also selected us it was mutual in that way um, in that time, we've been able to pay partners. I think it's really important, especially for those long-term uh, uh, contributions to be able to pay people. Same thing about consultants. You're asking people to contribute their time, their efforts, their energies, uh, and you don't want to take advantage of, a, of the population. Um, a memorandum of understanding is a great way to hold your institution accountable. It definitely can put out here are the responsibilities of the partner, but I would really emphasize that it puts out the responsibilities of the institution and puts them in writing and holds the institution to be accountable for things like if you're paying people, uh, what will that schedule of pay be? What will the institution be providing? If you're expecting people to come to your institution on a regular basis, are you providing transportation or is that, uh, does someone have to travel independently, et cetera, things like that. So I think creating a memorandum of understanding with your partners uh, will is very important for the institutions uh, to have that accountability. So what we're doing at Lincoln Park Zoo is we have a, a grant from the Institution of Museum and Library Services. And it's a grant that was built on the idea that we are co-creating interpretive signage with people who have disabilities. And we have a community engagement team. The top right hand picture in this slide is a picture of our community engagement team out in the community um, at a at like a, a, a local uh, uh, street program or street fair um, teaching about uh, 
uh, in this case, pollinators at a table and there are folks coming up to them and learning about pollinators. Um, so with our community engagement team, they're working in communities on the west side and they created a, a, a model for engaging with a population that often is engaged with either not at all or incorrectly. Uh, and so we did the same thing. We've been creating a model where you're totally looking at a population that is in, with people with disabilities who maybe are not contacted, not engaged with, or often are uh, improperly contacted or engaged with. So uh, what the, the first project has done is we've made a wayside sign, which is like a big sign that would just be on the, the side of gorillas. And the bottom picture here is of folks prototyping that sign. It's a sign right now that's made out of cardboard and it's in the shape of a male gorilla. And there are two folks who are uh, looking at the sign and giving some feedback to a third person in the middle who's a, who has the her, his back to the picture and is a Lincoln Park Zoo staff member who's collecting some feedback from them. In this case, it's uh, oral feedback. Um, and so with working with partners over long term, they were with us from the beginning. We talked all about extensive information about gorillas, learning about gorillas, about interpretation, and they helped us with each element of that from designing it from the beginning. Um, and they even assisted in this prototyping. They were even involved in collecting evaluation information. And there's two more of these projects to come. Altogether, this is scheduled to be a three-year project uh, with possible extension if needed. Um, for each of the projects, we've taken what were dozens of people who were attending those early sessions. Um, and then we've had uh, three partners on each of the, the signs that we're doing. Um, it's just been incredibly helpful. And the neat thing about this is the signage that we've been able to create with our partners' feedback doesn't really look like other signage that we have. So we can tell right away, doing this process is making unique things for us. Um, so it's been been a, a tremendously rewarding experience for us at the zoo and from talking with partners i know they've felt a lot of that too and we want this to be really a lasting ongoing relationship with them even after these projects are completed so with that i know we've had some questions come in so i will throw it thanks. to our uh, our team thanks who's handling so questions thanks so much bill um we'd like to invite our other speakers back on screen for our live q a and we're going to open up the floor to questions from the audience. So it seems that a couple of the questions that came in, money is really on people's minds. So I'm glad that you were following up, Bill, with your last comments. Our first question actually came from Maddie. And it's a question specifically for Jesse. Are you there, Jesse? How did yeah. you secure? People are curious. How did you secure the budget for paying your advisory board? Uh, well, that's it's a tricky question, right? Because you're often asked to show value before you can make an investment. Um, and so one of the things that worked for us was to find um, low cost or grant driven, grant -driven programming. Uh, at Second City, even though we were a commercial business and they still are a commercial business, um, we were able to get um, grant funding through TDF for the open caption uh, initiative there, which allowed us to open caption um, and sort of offer our very first access forward programming. Um, and, and again, celebrating the success of that program was hugely beneficial um, to, you know, uh, justifying further uh, investment in that area. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that while compensation for our advisory board wasn't as high as I would like, the other thing that I would have, the, the other um, advice I would give is what are those non-monetary forms of compensation? You should, absolutely should compensate with money, no question. Um, but what other additional benefits can your organization provide um, for folks who decide to um, engage in an advisory capacity? Thank you. Um, so also some other folks have noticed that they have a very small, very limited budget. Um, and you gave some advice about grants, but uh, do any of our other folks have any ideas about what would be some first steps to take? What kind of advice might you give somebody who's just getting started? 
and wants to improve their access efforts. I I have I I will say that I have very strong feelings that accessibility does not have to be expensive. Um, there's lots of things you can do without extra cost. And in fact, when Susan and I were working with um, the Group at Blind Service Association, uh, the cultural center wasn't. I don't think you were spending a lot of money on those programs, Susan. Uh, and the partners that we're having come to the zoo that come as groups over and over again. It's also not like that those programs are costing us extra. Yes, they are staff facilitated. Typically, I'm the staff member doing that. So there is my time that goes into that. But I'm also not having to put on um, expensive programs with them where we're using uh, materials that I have to be purchasing. Um, that's in both cases, like the Cultural Center and Lincoln Park Zoo, it's places to visit. I know a lot of places also are like when there's tickets for entry and they're trying to secure free tickets for groups can be uh, somewhat of a challenge. Um, I guess Susan and I are very fortunate that we don't have, we have free venues and we're not having to do that, but um, creating that partnership with a local organization, whether it is a specifically some, a, a group that represents people or, or is made up of people with disabilities or a senior community near you, um, that can be a great way to start early steps of having to um, uh, create programs that really benefit and support those folks the most um, and can be a fun way of even kind of using your imagination to create more programs. Again, I, I, I saw this question. I wasn't sure what the organization is for. A lot of my experience, my consulting comes with working with things that are like museums and and, and zoos and aquariums and things like that. So um, I... I, I always think that it's so much fun to have those long-term partnerships with people. It's also worth mentioning that the Cultural Access Collaborative does do equipment rental. Um, so if you are in the Chicago area, that's worth um, looking into. And there's lots of things that you can do accessibility-wise that may not cost money, but if you are willing to invest your time, uh, there's usually ways that you can do things. Uh, I went to a, a Babes with Blades show um, and they had done something with their open captioning where essentially it was just a slideshow and they had volunteers running it. And that's imperfect, uh, but it's better than not having captions. Um, you can spend time to create a social story about your venue. You can spend time to put together a cue list of light and sound warnings for your show. You can um, spend time creating alt text for the images on your website. And none of these things are going to be perfect, um, but they will be better than not having them. Um, so if you're willing to invest your time, even if you don't have a ton of money, uh, there are definitely ways to pursue access. Yeah, I, I, I wanna um, agree with what Andy just said and also add that like, it was one of the more exciting moments of innovation for us trying to figure out how to, um, you know, once once our grant ended with TDF and we were no longer able to offer that open caption for free, we had to redesign um, our program. And what it meant was we got to custom build it for improvisation because sketch and improvisation, as you can imagine, um, may be difficult uh, to open caption to uh, you know maintain the integrity of the setup punchline structure, make sure we're not giving jokes away before they're delivered, right? Um, and rhythm and all of that is really important. And with some investment from our, of just time of our technical director and building out a QLab infrastructure, we were able to actually really innovate um, in the space and find some new technological opportunities. Well, this has really been a tremendous program. I mean, we have so many participants um, really giving us a lot of kudos and letting us know that this is something that they really want to hear more about. Um, but at this time, unfortunately, we have to bring today's program to a close. I want to extend a hearty thank you to our guest, Jesse Swanson, for your insightful additions to the conversation. And thank you to our whole accessibility service providers and the CoLab production team for making this program possible. And if you're interested in getting involved, please do. If you want to get involved in a collaborative, stay tuned. We're going to be recruiting our all-new steering committee for the spring, and committee members will serve for a two-year term, and we are looking for representatives not only from Chicago, but all across Illinois, so stay tuned for that. We're going to be posting a call for the application, and if you have questions, you can always reach out to us at info 
at culturalaccesscollab.org. And if you have a moment, please, we're all about getting feedback as we've been talking about for the last hour. So please answer our brief 10 question survey about today's program because you know we would love to know what you found helpful and what you'd like to see more of in the future. And very finally, thank you all for being part of today's conversation and for offering your support to CAC. We're primarily volunteer run and depend entirely on grants and donations to fund our work. So please stay tuned for news about our next event coming up at the end of March. And we're excited to be partnering with the Chicago's Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities on that event. And until then, stay safe, stay warm. Thank you. Thank you for supporting the collaborative. Scan the QR code at center or donate at culturalaccesscollab.org forward slash support. Credits appear. Nothing about us without us. Meaningful collaboration with the disability community. Presented by Cultural Access Collaborative. For workshop resources and more information, visit culturalaccesscollab.org. Presenting speakers. Moderator Susan Friel, CAC. Jesse Swanson, producer, arts administrator, and comedian. Bill Green, Hart Prince Fund Accessibility and Inclusion Manager at Lincoln Park Zoo. Andy Wilson, House Manager and Accessibility Coordinator at the Goodman Theater. Workshop Accessibility, Efficiency Reporting, Real-Time Captioning. Faith Interpreting Service, ASL Interpretation. Video editing, captioning, and audio description by BridgetMelton.com.